let's begin. You know, um, ants are small, and ants are weak, and ants are stupid, uh, and ants can't learn very much, and ants don't know how to talk, and don't know how to use tools. But I think that ants can do some amazing things, and I want to talk to you about what some of those amazing things are, and then talk about how we could think about how we maybe could do some amazing things too, maybe um, maybe in the style of ants a little bit. Um, so let's talk about first some of the amazing things that ants can do, and then we'll see how they can do it. The first uh, amazing thing that ants can do that I want to talk about are the amazing things that ants can do with their food. Um, one thing that you may already know is that ants raise livestock. They um, tend to aphids, which are another small insect that sucks the uh, sweet sap of plants. And then uh, aphids are so greedy that they excrete a bunch of uh, this sap that they eat, and the ants love to eat that. So they come up to the aphids and touch, rub their back ends, and the aphids give them a little food, and they eat it. And uh, this is so wonderful uh, for the ants that they build shelters for the aphids, they protect them from pests, and sometimes they move the aphids around from tree to tree. So really, uh, they kind of invented uh, domesticated animals long before we did. Some other uh, great things that ants do are uh, fungus farming. You might have heard maybe of the leafcutter ants, and this is a type of ant that um, has an underground fungus garden at the base of their colony, and they feed this fungus with leaves. They go out and gather leaves and chop them up, that's why they're called leafcutters, and they bring leaves back and uh, feed them to the ants. And then, with a fungus that's produced, the entire colony is fed. And this is real amazing also because this type of fungus doesn't grow anywhere else in the world. It's only through the sort of symbiosis with the ants that this happens. Uh, there's a lot of other uh, great things ants do with their food too, but just to give you one final example, um, there are these honey jar ants. Most ants, uh, you know, don't store food. Uh, they eat uh, things and then it's gone, so every day they have to come and bring back food. Uh, but there are these honey jar ants, and the way that they solve this problem is by eating food and then getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> Uh, until uh, they are mobilized and they hang from the ceiling inside their nest and then uh, times are tough and they need some food, some of the other ants come to them and say, give me some food. Well, they don't say that in language, but they push them their antenna and then the ant regurgitates some of its food and gets a little smaller and feeds the others. So I think that's a really amazing um, food storage technique. <laughs> Some of the other uh, really great things that ants do are uh, in the fields of architecture and building and construction. And um, I think army ants are a really great uh, example of uh, some of the ingenuity that ants can have when it comes to building. Uh, army ants are this sort of mobile carnivorous ant. In other words, they live in groups and they travel around uh, in South America and they eat living things. But since they're on the move, they can't build a whole house. So how do they protect themselves? How do they live? The answer is that they build a giant sphere of ants when they're on the move. They all crowd around and protect the brood. That's the larva and the eggs, uh, the ants that are developing their children. And they also protect the queen. And sometimes they even use their bodies to do things like build bridges or uh, reach areas that they wouldn't be able to reach. So they're really ingenious builders. Uh, then there are the weaver ants, another uh, ant that is really has amazing architectural uh, prowess. That is an ant that makes houses out of live leaves of trees. And how does it do it? It weaves those leaves together with silk. Now ants don't give off silk, they're not like spiders, but their larva, at their larval stage, uh, those mini uh, child ants give off silk because what happens is they are sort of these grubs and then they give off the silk and make a cocoon around themselves and they transform into ants. Well, the grown ants go and take their babies and bring them around and use them to weave uh, silk with. They basically sort of squeeze them like a living um, pot of glue, if you will, to uh, hold their boots together. So I think that's another uh, really great example of ant ingenuity and um, ability. And just as a final example of ant achievement, I give you the um, gatekeeper ant. 
And that is a type of ant that has an enormous head, and um, it will use its head as a door in, a, uh, in an ant nest. So I think we have a picture of it here. Yeah, that's this one. This is its head right here. So, um, to stop up the nest, to keep people out, that ant, that ant will put his head in the hole and completely fill it. And then if another ant wants to come in, he will come and rub on the head of the ant, and if it smells right, uh, he'll let them in. So that's a really, I think, uh, interesting and, and powerful way of, of using your uh, self to uh, and solve your architectural problem. <laughs> <laughs> so how do, how do ants um, achieve such amazing results as these? Well, um, basically, I think the main way that they're able to get anything done since they're so small and weak and dumb is through organization, through getting together. And so how do ants live? They basically um, live in groups. The ants are social insects, just like um, honeybees and termites. So they live together by the tens or hundreds or thousands or millions. Um, and then uh, through sort of systems of cooperation, they get stuff done. And typically, one of the ways that ants cooperate is they divide up the labor. Um, so different ants are in what are called different castes. For example, the work of giving birth to children is all done by one ant, the queen. And most of the other work, like uh, tending the nest and uh, raising the children and stuff like that is done by the workers. And those are female ants, but they don't reproduce, they're sterile ants. And then uh, every year, there are sexual ants, and those are uh, sexual females and males, and they have wings, and then they fly out and mate, and then the males die, and then the females are new queens, and then they try to form a new colony. So that's how they divide up the labor, more or less. Um, and so how do, they, how do they organize themselves in many ways? Through uh, chemical communication. In other words, they don't use language, but they change food all the time. They, an ant will come up to another ant, even if they're not hungry, and spit up a little food, and the other ant will accept it. And um, ants are also always licking each other, constantly licking their babies and licking the queen and each other. So through the system of licking and food exchange, um, everyone can sort of paste on their breath what's going on in the colony. They can tell if the queen is healthy, uh, if there are babies, if there's enough food or not, so then you can sort of decide what to do uh, based on that. Um, so, but my next question is, okay, given that um, system of getting things done, what are, what's the, what are the implications of that? What is it like to have a, a nest lifestyle and would it be good for us? How would, um, what are the, what is the sort of meanings of that? Well, my first uh, sort of question along those lines as I'm looking at ants and trying to evaluate them is, um, are ants free? Are they, are they free animals or are they uh, more robotic and slave kind of uh, machines? Well, I think on the first glance from your sort of received notions, I think most people think of ants as not really uh, very free at all. They uh, cooperate too much. They're um, always working for the good of the nest, sacrificing themselves. Uh, they don't really seem like individuals at all. They kind of just seem like part of the herd. And uh, they don't seem to act on their own welfare yet. They, will, um, they always are just working for someone else, it seems like. So they don't really seem very free. But on the other hand, they're free in the sense that no one actually tells them what to do. You know, um, there is no hierarchy in an ant society. The queen doesn't say, you do this. It's not like human society. There's no orders. Uh, no one um, is telling uh, another ant what to do. Ants decide on their own what to do. They make up their own mind, and uh, that can be based on um, the situation they see around them, or their own learning, or their innate instincts. Um, and to a certain extent, their caste also determines what they do, but not completely. Uh, if you're a worker ant, you have many different things you can choose from, and the queen can do different things at different times, and likewise, the sexuals can make different decisions. So um, while they sort of don't really seem free, at least on a certain uh, definition of free, in other words, not being coerced, they do seem to be free. So I, I want to follow that up. Uh, thinking more about the idea of individuality. Um, 
So we, we said ants, well, don't really seem free, but they, they are kind of free, at least by one uh, metric. I think there's a similar thing going on with individuality. I think when you think about ants and you look at them and you see them moving around in the nest, they don't seem, they don't smell like individuals. They're uh, dependent on the colony and they're devoted to the colony. And they also have this kind of uncanniness. And what I mean by that is um, that they're kind of weird and creepy and <laughs> robot-like. They're just scurrying around and um, they don't seem like, you know, like we as individuals, we have purpose and we're, you know, we know what we're doing. We're not just all part of this big group. They uh, kind of don't really seem like real individuals. But also, I think, if you think about what, okay, well, what is an individual? If uh, at least one sort of gross measure of individuality is being a unique organism, right? So an ant is not like a foot or a liver or something like that. It is, um, it is its own thing. It's an animal. It lives. If you take it away from the group, it can live without the group. Like if you have an ant, uh, ant hive or ant colony, ant farm, you know, and you raise them yourself, they, they can exist. So they are, even though they seem kind of weird and not really individual in the traditional sense, or at least from our like received notions, they are actually individual uh, organisms. Um, so um, given these sort of like weird things about ants, uh, uh, let's, let's, let's move on. I have, I have another uh, thought about this. I think that there's a way in which ants disappoint us, a way that, uh, that they sort of disappoint our received notions of like freedom and individuality that is helpful because it's like provides a way to help us think about, well, since ants don't seem to be free and don't seem to be individuals, what does, what does it mean to be a free individual? And I think one of the key things, at least in my own thinking about it, is this idea of uh, self-interest or profit. I think it's hard to imagine uh, and a free individual that's not sort of motivated by self-interest. And moreover, uh, not just protecting itself, but moreover, um, an individual that actually is sort of trying to acu uh, accumulate things. And there's, there's many ways that this is expressed in society. Uh, and two sort of the uh, obvious and sort of central ways are the idea of capitalism and evolution. And both of those are uh, systems, right, that ways of talking about how the world is organized that um, where the sort of central part is an individual that's seeking profit, seeking its own self-interest, and that the idea is that sort of organization will develop or things will be good or things will get better uh, based on that kind of uh, notion. But, um, but when you look at ants, that's weird. That doesn't really work right. Uh, they can't because ants, like we were talking about, give us the sort of different model of free individuals that aren't really uh, after their own self-interest. And that's confusing, and that makes them seem weird, not just us um, sitting here sort of, you know, philosophizing about it, but also to scientists. Um, as I've been researching ants, I find out that many insect biologists have a lot of trouble talking about ants because um, most theories of insect behavior or, or uh, animal behavior, human behavior even, are based on this notion of um, you know, survival of the fittest or natural selection or something like that. Like, you go out, you have kids, you fight off other people, your kids have more kids, so the more that you have kids and your kids have kids, uh, that's the sort of engine that drives stuff. That's like a, you know, a genetic profit, right? Like, you're getting more and more of your genes, you're driving on other people's genes, you're trying to work on your own genes. But that doesn't, those theories don't work with ants because ants don't have children. Um, ants don't have a genetic uh, type of accumulation. And individual ants, a worker, it never has any kids, so what it does uh, in its life doesn't make any difference about uh, how its kids work. So that is very confusing and frustrating for scientists, and then they, to sort of get around that or to recuperate this idea of a selfish individual, they come up with other uh, theories, like the selfish gene theory, which you might have heard of. There's a book by that title uh, in the 70s, I think. Anyway, that's a theory that looks at genes as the individuals. It's not the organisms, it's the genes. And an organism is just a way to make more genes uh, for the organism. That's kind of a creepy thought. 
there's a, and then there, there are also other ways. So that's taking the individual down out of the organism and putting it at like the cellular or molecular level. There's other ways of thinking about individuals or trying to sort of recuperate this idea of competing individuals uh, when talking about ants, which is to bring it up higher to the sort of super organism level. And that's when people think of the whole nest as the individual. They say, well, the nest is the individual. Nests compete with other nests. Nests have children. Uh, it's not the ants. The ants are really more like uh, organs. Uh, you know, an ant is more just like a cell in a body. Um, and there are a lot of other uh, theories as well. But um, let me let's let's go on here because we've got a lot of other stuff we want to cover, and uh, and I, I I just want to keep it relatively brief. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to conclude now. We haven't, like I was saying, we haven't covered everything. There's so many different places we could go from this, but I just want to come back to this idea that we had at the beginning about ants as uh, sort of models of uh, having powerful and crazy, flexible, creative kind of behavior, <laughs> especially uh, when it comes to systems of building and feeding themselves. And then also, not only in their sort of physical life, but I think also conceptually, ants are really powerful in the way that they give us new, maybe different ways of thinking about uh, what it is to be free or what it is to be an individual. And um, so, you know, what I'm interested in is like, how can we learn from this? How can we uh, put this to work in our daily life? And you might say, well, Amos, you know, ants and uh, people are really pretty different. Uh, we don't have a lot in common. How could we possibly learn anything from them? But I'm giving you back this uh, counterexample of birds. You know, um, people look at birds and birds fly. People uh, are, can be inspired by birds to fly. We fly in our own way. It's different than the way the birds fly. But learning from birds, we've learned how to fly. And I think maybe similarly, there are ways that we can learn from ants about it, how to get along better and how to accomplish some of these amazing and exciting kind of things that ants are able to do that we can't do. And how could we do that? Well, you know, I, uh, I'm not really sure. Uh, but I will, I will give you a few maybe starter places that we could start from and then uh, just maybe possibilities lines of investigation. Number one, I would say food exchange. You know, ants are always, like I said, giving each other food. Maybe there are ways that we can give each other food uh, that could help our society, help us cooperate, help us uh, understand each other, help us understand uh, our place, and, um, and build uh, greater, more flexible, creative things. Maybe there's something having to do with food. I'm not sure. Feeding other people or hanging out with people when you eat. Perhaps. I don't know if we should actually exchange it mouth to mouth or not. There's, I guess we'll have to, this, this, these, this is just, these are just ideas. Another idea is maybe, uh, maybe group building projects. You know, some of the things that are great about ants are the way they come together and all use their bodies to build things and cooperate and um, maybe there are ways that we can do that. I mean, we already have a lot of group building projects, but maybe we could think about different ways to organize things when we build a town or a building, uh, or uh, you know, maybe other types of groups, maybe like when we build um, a university or something, maybe there are ways that we could bring lots of individuals together uh, to cooperate uh, using sort of ant-like models. And then finally, I would say another bit, it's maybe hard to see that, but over in the uh, corner, it says novel uses of the body. I think one of the most exciting and uh, inspiring things that ants do is the way that they can use their own bodies to uh, accomplish all sorts of great tasks. And maybe there's ways that we can learn from them to use our bodies and move in different ways. Ways we could use our body to uh, make society better. Maybe there are ways we can use our bodies to uh, understand each other and cooperate and um, further the ideas uh, or just alternative ideas of uh, freedom and individuality. That human purity, maybe. <laughs> um, so thank you very, very much. That's all I've got for you tonight.